Well, it's so good to see you guys today. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm the lead pastor here. And we've been in a series the last few weeks called We Believe. And just to kind of catch you up on that, if you hadn't been with us and you can watch those online, the first week we talked about the authority of the Bible. We talked about how important, obviously, the Scripture is and then how it's from God, it's historically reliable, and it's what we should build our lives on. And that's an important foundational message because everything else we teach is based on what the Bible says. So if the Bible is not reliable, then we're in trouble, right? So we talked about the historical reliability of the Bible and how to build your life on what God's Word says. The second week, we talked about who is God. Who is God? I mean, obviously, we need to understand the framework for who God is so that we can know what God wants for us, what it means to follow Him. Uh, the second week, we talked about uh, who is Jesus and what Jesus had done for us uh, on the cross. And then last week, we specifically zoned in on what the work of the cross means for our lives. And then today, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to kick this conversation off with you guys this morning and talk to you about past experiences. Have you guys ever had a weird church experience? Yes? Yeah, okay. I hope it's not today. Please, I hope it's not today, okay? But uh, every, every one of us had weird church experiences, and for those who know my story, I, I'd gone to church when I was a little kid and then didn't go to church for many years and then met Jesus and started going to church. And Right after I had become a Christian, uh, these folks I knew said, hey, you need to come to church with us. And so I had been in the church. The only church I'd really been exposed to was, you know, the church where I was going. And it was an awesome church, preaching the Bible, great stuff happening. And they said, hey, I want you to come to church. We're having this special revival thing. Uh, oh, no. Uh, special revival thing on, on Wednesday night. Come with us. And so I'm like, okay, I'll go. So I go to this thing, and wow, was, were my eyes open to some interesting stuff. I mean, I'll give them this. They had some spirit, okay? They were fired up. They were excited. But the people running around and jumping and hooping and hollering just really freaked me out. I really thought, you know what, I may turn this uh, Christian card back in. I don't know if I want to do this or not because this is way out in left field. And they were very passionate. They talked a lot about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit and all this stuff. And, and I'm a new believer and I'm going, okay, I got to read the Bible about this because everything that I've read, I've never seen some of these kind of things happening, right? So I had this really strange experience. And from that experience, it almost made me kind of like shy away from things of the Spirit because I was exposed to this kind of extreme thing, right? And some of us have that background. We grew up in that and we have some certain paranoias about a negative experience that we had in our lives. Well, I had another experience on the other extreme. When I was 21 and I had been preaching for a very short time, I, I was the first year uh, in, in my junior year in college, I was uh, my first year really at the Christian school where I was going, taking Bible classes, learning theology and all this stuff. And uh, one of my professors, he says, hey, uh, I'm preaching at this church uh, and he told me the name of the church. He's like, oh, yeah, I've driven by that church. He says, I'm filling in there, and I want to know if you'll come preach for me because I'm going to be out on Sunday. I was like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. I've never preached to, you know, that many times to like a group of adults, and this is going to be really a great experience, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And he goes, well, I just, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a group that's real laid back, so just be prepared for that. I'm like, okay. Well, I get there, and right when I walk into the door, this, this older gentleman comes and meets me and says, hey, preacher. I said, yes, sir, that's me. He said, I just want to tell you something. You going to do an invitation today after this service? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to share about Jesus and give people the opportunity to accept Christ and begin a relationship with him. And he goes, well, I just want to tell you something, son. Don't expect anything to happen. <laughs> I'm dead serious. He said, that ain't anybody walked the aisle in this church in 10 years. And don't expect it to start today. Woohoo! I'm so excited to be here. Can I tell you, my morale was really up. I had to psych myself out big time to get past, fired up for that sermon. But I preached the sermon, man. I preached my guts out. During the worship, people were standing there like a stick in the mud, like, oh, the wonderful cross. Yes. The cross is so wonderful. Jesus saved me. Amen. I mean, it was just death, okay? It was just a dead church. And, and I was preaching my guts out, and, and, and I get done, and I do the invitation. This old gentleman slips out of his seat, 
and starts coming my way. And I was like, oh yeah, baby, 10 years, it's over now. He comes down and he comes and meets me down at the front and he says, son, I just want to tell you, you did a good job. I was like, well, at least I got that. Nobody got saved, but we got a good job, son. My point is we've all had experiences on both extremes, right, where people were kind of taking the things of the Spirit and taking them way out there. We've seen it on TV, people knocking each other down and doing all kinds of stuff. And it's made some of us paranoid, and then others of us have had other experiences on the other extreme that have shaped the way we see things. And I think for many of us, we come in here today, and we have all these different experiences, and they're keeping us from seeing who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit of God wants to work in each of our lives. Our experiences shape the way we see things. And for many of us, it's really, you know, impacted the way we experience God. And I just want to tell you guys, there's nothing that's going to happen in this church. There's nobody that's going to get saved. There's nothing great that's going to happen apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. R.C. Sproul says this. He says, the church you attend is holy and set apart insofar as the Holy Spirit is present and functioning in the lives of the people who are there. You see, the the power of God's work in this church and in us is going to be as much as his spirit is present and functioning in our lives. We will only live lives that honor God, as our sign says, by the spirit that lives in us. And so I want to ask you guys a question today as we dive into this topic of the Holy Spirit about your life. And that is this, is the Holy Spirit present and real in your life? Is God's spirit present and real in your life? J.I. Packer, another theologian, says this. He says, the Christian's life in all its aspects, he covers everything here, intellectual and ethical, devotional and relational, upsurging in worship and outgoing in witness, is supernatural. Only the spirit can sustain it. You see, you have many people out here and they live on the extremes of almost this manipulation of things of the spirit and and they're living on the extreme and they're, they're confusing and they're living wild, right? And then you have other people who are suppressing God's spirit in their lives and, and they've become numb to the things of God. And we have to find some middle ground here on, okay, God, who are you? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does this mean for our lives? Because the Holy Spirit is what makes relationship with God possible. The reason that you can have a personal relationship with God is because God's spirit lives in you. That's what literally connects you to the power of God. That's what makes the relationship. You see, Jesus came, sent by God the Father to live the life you couldn't live. We talked about this last week and died the death that you and I deserve on the cross. And when the sacrifice that Jesus made On the cross, his blood was shed. When that is applied to you, when you call out on the name of Jesus for salvation, you then become a blameless being. You become what the scripture refers to as a temple of God, and God's spirit can now dwell in you. That's what makes the relationship personal. So is the Holy Spirit present and real in your life? Today in this message, I'm going to answer three questions. So we're going to cover a lot of ground, and I'm going to cover a lot of scripture, but Hopefully when we walk out of this room today, we're gonna go, I I understand that better. And this matters because a lot of us are confused about this. A lot of us don't understand these things. And it's really important to understand who the Holy Spirit is so that we can live the life that God's called us to live. So the first question I'm gonna answer is who is the Holy Spirit? We're gonna talk about who he is. The second thing I'm gonna talk about is what is his role in our salvation? What is the Holy Spirit's role in this salvation that I have? And then the third thing and this is really the relationship side of it, what is his role in our daily lives? What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to be present and real in my life? What impact does that have? What does that mean for me Monday? What does that mean for me Tuesday? What does that mean for my life? Who is the Holy Spirit is the first thing we're gonna look at. And I'm gonna cover three things in this, and these are really important, folks, because if the Holy Spirit isn't what I'm about to tell you, then the Holy Spirit can't do the next two things we're gonna teach on. Okay, the first thing I want you to know about who is the Holy Spirit is number one, he is God. He is God. I'm gonna teach next week on the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But today we're gonna talk specifically about the Spirit. He is God. He's not just some force that floats around somewhere out there and is some sort of angel that floats around. No, 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 no. That's not who the Holy Spirit is. You need to understand the Holy Spirit is 
part of God. He is God. He is the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He was there from the beginning. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says this, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void or empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It's really interesting because if you go to Genesis 1, you will see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Think about when God created man. God is having a conversation amongst himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and, they, and he says, let us, talking about Father, Son, and Spirit, let us create man in our image. Let us create man in our image. 1 Corinthians in the New Testament chapter 2 verse 14 says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. There it is, Spirit of God. But considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. You see, you and I can't understand the things from God unless we have the Spirit of God. Why? Because He is God. He is in relationship with God the Father in the way that we understand the things of God, the way we grow. We talk about grow, connect, grow, serve, share. That's kind of our values around here. The way that we grow is by the Holy Spirit's present in our li- presence in our lives that over time, throughout this journey of following Jesus, shapes us and makes us and increases our, our knowledge, our faith, our understanding of who God is. That's what it means to grow. The Holy Spirit is not some bonus. It's not like icing on the cake, okay? It is the cake. It is part of the whole process. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. He is God. He's not just some accessory, you know, like you, you buy a new bag and along with it comes, you know, a coin purse with your new bag. Now, it's, it's, it's not some accessory. He's not some earrings that we wear that only the super Christians get. No, no, no. He is God, and he is part of the process of following God. The second thing I want you to know, and I kind of already hit on this a little bit, is not only is he God, but he's part of the Trinity, which reinforces he is God. Jesus is teaching in John 15, 26, and he says this, when the advocate, talking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He's part of this trinity, this part of who God is. And I'm going to teach on that in detail next week, so don't miss that. We also see him when Jesus in Matthew uh, 28 is giving the great commission and he's telling his disciples he's already died on the cross. He's been resurrected and we're at the point where Jesus is about to leave earth and go be with God the Father. And he tells his disciples in Matthew 28, he says, because of everything that's happened, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, when we baptize people here, I think that's next week. If you want to get baptized, let us know. Mark it on your card. We baptize people in the name, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they are all part of God. They are part of the relationship that we have with God. He is part of the Trinity. I could give you tons of examples that reinforce he is God. He's part of the Trinity. This goes back to the very foundation of Christianity. There was a document in in 325 AD known as the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed, man, it describes beautifully the divinity of the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit being God. It says this, I believe in the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. The Holy Spirit is worshiped and glorified along with the Father and the Son, who spoke by the prophets. It cannot be overestimated that the Holy Spirit is divine. This is not new information. This whole series is about basics of Christianity. But I believe that many of us don't have these basics, so we really want to dig into them and understand why we believe what we believe. Because here's the thing, God is a systematic God. If you really study the things of God, everything is connected and everything makes sense, but you gotta look at the whole picture. He is not only God, he is not only part of the Trinity, but the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit's not an it. 
It's not, you know, some floating around ghost somewhere. No, he is a person. That's why we refer to him as the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. John 14, 16 through 17, it says this. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Check this out. The world cannot accept him. Doesn't say it, it is a him. Everywhere it refers to the Holy Spirit as him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. This is the cool thing about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in each Christ follower's life, but yet the Holy Spirit is also present amongst us. That's what Jesus is talking about. He lives with you. He is present among you as believers, but he also lives in you. Such an amazing thing. He is a person. He is God. He is the Trinity. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says this, and these are empowered by one and the same spirit who appropriations to each one individually as he wills. He, he is a person. These are kind of basics, but I want you guys to understand that the Holy Spirit's not some id. It's not some power that's just out there. It's not some angel thing. It's not something to be afraid of. It is God. It's the whole reason you have a personal relationship with God. And I'm going to explain more of that in a minute. But he is God. He is part of the Trinity. He is a person. That's who the Holy Spirit is. That's important to understand because once you understand who he is, then you can understand his work in salvation and his work in our lives on a daily basis, which is what we're gonna talk about next. As I explain um, what his role is in our salvation, I wanna invite Charles to come out. Um, Charles is gonna be my prop today. Oh, don't you love this guy? You do such a good job, man, I love you. You can take a seat. This may be bad for you, okay? <laughs> uh, but, but the Holy Spirit plays a role in, in our salvation. And, and I want you guys, to understand this, I'm gonna give you three words and we're gonna unpack each of these. And these are theological words, but I'm gonna explain what they mean. I try my best not to just throw words out on the table and then hope that you figure out what they mean. I try to explain them. The first word is justification. The second word is regeneration. And the third word is sanctification. Now, I know those are like, what? What is this guy talking about? I'm gonna explain these. The first thing I want you to know is the Holy Spirit is part of the justification process. And this is simply what justification means. Justification is a judicial act where God removes a person's sin and declares them to be in a position of righteousness before God. Ultimately, it means when Charles is justified before God, he is right with God. You see, when he calls on the name of Jesus for salvation, the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross is applied to the life of Charles and he stands before God, blameless and holy, based nothing on he ever did, but completely and fully based on what Jesus did for him. I love what Winfield Bevan says about this. He's a young theologian. He says, justification is a judicial act. I just kind of explained that. It's, it's in the court of God, you are made right with God, okay? Where God remits, or you could use the word, removes a person's sins and declares them to be in a position of righteousness before God. It is what God does for us. It is by the merits, don't miss this part, of Christ that we receive justification. Charles doesn't sit here today before you made right with God based on any merits he's done. He's made right with God based on the merits of Jesus Christ. That's why we worship Jesus. Uh, he goes on and he says, which is the forgiveness of sins. Justification by grace through faith is a foundational Christian teaching. Check this out. Don't miss this next part. I love the way Winfield unpacks this. He says, the spirit is the agent that affects justification in the life of the believer. So Jesus said, I read many verses just a minute ago, that Jesus said, I'm going to send one after I leave. And that's the Holy Spirit. And he's going to be with you forever. See, when we call out on the name of Jesus, when Charles in his life asked Jesus to save him and asked Jesus to forgive him, the blood of Christ covered Charles' life, and the one who applied that sacrifice is the Holy Spirit. 
You see, then Charles becomes a blameless one. He becomes a righteous person, not righteous based on what he has done. He doesn't have any room to boast, the scripture says, but he boasts in Jesus because now he stands before God, the Father, blameless because of Jesus. And what's awesome is the Holy Spirit of God then comes and dwells in him. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in him until the sacrifice of Jesus is applied to him because when the sacrifice of Jesus is applied to him, he becomes a temple of God that God's Spirit then can dwell in. But God's spirit can't dwell in him until the sacrifice of Jesus is applied to him. Make sense? All right. Let me go on and read this. He says, the spirit is the agent that affects justification in the life of leaders. The spirit applies Christ's work of reconciliation, that means to make the relationship right, to us in order to transform our hostility toward God into fellowship with God. So when, 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 the just, when the blood of Christ is applied to Charles, he's justified, he's made right with God. He goes from being one that is hostile with God because of his sin to being one who is in fellowship with God. Ben, uh, uh, Winfield goes on and he says, As the Father sent his Son to die for us, the Spirit applies the fruit of his death to our lives in justification. You see, the Spirit plays a role in us being made right with God. He applies the work of Jesus to Charles. When we pray and we say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I need you. I want you to forgive me. I want to come into relationship with you. He applies that work. And Charles immediately, and you immediately, become right with God because of the work of Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Simultaneously, at that same time, God's spirit comes and lives inside of you, comes and lives inside of Charles. It's the second word I gave you, regeneration. Regeneration simply means to be born again. It's to have rebirth, to be regenerated, to go from a place of spiritual death to a place of spiritual life. Uh, I do want to read this verse, though, before I jump to that. Uh, to cover justification. Romans 8, by the way, it's a great chapter on the Holy Spirit. Verse 14 through 16 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Before I dig into regeneration, I just want to help you guys know this. There, there's a lot of people, in my opinion, and based on 2,000 years of Christian history uh, and theologians who've studied this you know, vastly, that there are people who misteach this. They teach that you can be justified with God, but that doesn't mean you have the Holy Spirit yet. You got to ask for that later after you get more spiritual. That's not true. That is just not biblically accurate. Anybody who teaches that, they will proof text. What that means is they will take verses out of context. That's like me grabbing a chunk of verses and taking them and reading them and believing those verses stand alone outside of the context of the whole Bible. They will proof text and they will teach that, oh, you, you know, you've got to now ask for the Holy Spirit and then you'll be baptized in the Spirit. Now, maybe that's your background and where you go. I'd encourage you to really study that. I would challenge you to really study that. Because the, the very Holy Spirit is the one who comes and dwells in you from Romans 8, 14, 6, 16 that I just read. And he's the one that, that comes and lives in you and makes you a son of God. He's the one who makes you right with God. He's the one that applies justification. So he doesn't justify you and then go, bye, I'll see you later. Call on me later. That's not what he does. That's not what he does. People that teach that often will teach and say, uh, they'll use Peter for an example. And they'll say, well, you see, Peter denied Jesus three times. And uh, the reason he didn't have the Holy Spirit. Well, no, duh. Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. Jesus hadn't been resurrected yet. So the, the, the sacrificial work of Jesus couldn't yet be applied to Peter for the Spirit to dwell in. But Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit. And he's going to dwell in you. And he's going to change the game, right? Right? So they, they use a lot of different things like that. And I just want to tell you, that creates spiritual elitism. Like, I'm more spiritual than you because I've got the Spirit, something you don't yet have. But if you'll just come deeper in the water, if you'll get out of the shallow water and come into the deep water with me, I'll show you where the Spirit is. And it's just not biblical. Very, the very essence of salvation and that God's Spirit lives in you is what I'm going to cover now, regeneration. 
It's the idea of being born again. It's, to, it's where the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. And when you are justified, made right with God, simultaneously God's Spirit comes in you. That's why you have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with God without the Spirit of God in you. It's the thing that connects you to the power of God. I want you just to think one example on prayer. Prayer is a systematic thing. We pray to God the Father, through Christ the Son, by the Spirit that lives in us. That's how prayer works. It's a systematic thing. Well, if you don't have the Spirit, you can't even conversate with God. You don't have access. I taught on this last week. It's by the cross that we have access to the throne room of God. And I told you that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God the Father and literally taking your prayer request and handing those to God the Father. The reason he's handing those is because the Spirit of God lives in you, which makes you in relationship with God. Why? Because you've been born again. This is a powerful transformation that God's Spirit does in you when you call on the name of Jesus for salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. When that happens, you are justified before God, you become a holy temple of God, and the Holy Spirit of God comes and resides in you. That is what awakens you and makes you go from spiritual death to spiritual life. Without the presence of the Holy Spirit, you're still spiritually dead. If you're spiritually dead, you can't be justified before God. Make sense? It, there's an order here. It's really important. Titus 3, 4 and 5, this is uh, 4 and 7, this is uh, in the New Testament. It says, but when the kindness of uh, and love of God our Savior appeared. He loved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. See, it's not because of the righteous things we have done, it's because of his mercy through Jesus. It goes on, it says, he saved us. How? How did he save us? Through the washing, check this out, of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It, it is rebirth that saves a person. Justification and regeneration they happen simultaneously. When you are immediately made right with God because of the blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes and awakens you and lives in you. Verse 6, he goes, Whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified, that's what I covered just a minute ago, by his grace we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Now Jesus talked about this regeneration as well. He didn't use that exact word. That's a theological word, but he called it born again. In John chapter 3, Jesus was having a conversation with a religious leader known as Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and said, Jesus, uh, how can I experience, how can I know the kingdom of God? How can, I, how can I have relationship? How can I have salvation? And in John 3, 5 and 8, Jesus answers, here it is. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God, check this out, don't miss this, unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. That means when he talks about born of water, he's not talking about baptism. He's talking about human life. Born of water and of the Spirit. The reason why is you get the answer in the next verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Humans give birth to humans. But the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be as surprised at me saying this. You must be born again. There it is very clearly. You must be born again. That's why we talk about we are born again Christians. We've been regenerated. We've gone from spiritual death to spiritual life. It's not a religious list that you keep and somehow earn your way to God. No, you are justified by the work of Jesus Christ and you are transformed by the Spirit of God coming to live in you. He goes on in verse 8, he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus was a religious leader who knew the law front and back. And he came to Jesus point blank. How can I enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus was very clear. You must be born again. How are you born again? You ask. You confess your sins. You repent of your sins and you believe in Jesus Christ. You must be born again. The Holy Spirit is part of that process. He applies the work of Jesus Christ, which makes you right with God. He comes and dwells in you, which regenerates you. But then he doesn't just leave you. He stays with you, and he moves to the third phase. Now, justification and regeneration, they happen simultaneously. Sanctification is the process moving forward. So now Charles is sanctified, I mean, uh, justified before God. He's made right with God. He's born again. He's in relationship with God. The Spirit of God dwells in him. The Bible says that the Spirit of God no longer dwells in temples made by human hands. 
but it now dwells in the lives of believers, in, the, in the, the, the temple made by God, which is a human. And if anybody, by the way, just a little side note, if anybody ever teaches, oh, no, you gotta, you gotta ask for the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Holy Spirit, that's what's missing in your life, I would point you to study the book of Corinthians. Paul is addressing a group of sex-crazed people who have a lot of garbage and baggage, and he tells them, what are you doing? You've been bought with a price. God's spirit lives in you. When Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in chapter two, he, or maybe it's chapter one, I can't remember off the top of my head. This is not in my notes. He, he, he tells him, he says, you've been marked with a seal. The, whole, the, the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing your salvation and eternity. You see, God's gonna cash that deposit that's placed in you when you stand before him. And that deposit placed in you is his spirit's presence. The Holy Spirit justifies us. He regenerates us. We're born again, but then he sanctifies us. You see, Charles is in that process now. If you're a Christ follower, you're in that process now. He's being regenerated. I mean, he's being sanctified. That means he's on the journey of living and becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification is simply the process of being restored in the image of God. You see, we were created to be in relationship with God, but we all sinned and we broke away from the plan that God had. Salvation realigns us in relationship with God. And sanctification is the process of, why did God leave me here? Why did God leave you here? The reason that God left me and you here after he saved us is because he has a plan and a purpose for us to accomplish on this earth. And that is to bring glory and honor to his name through how we live and to spread his message. Sanctification is the process to equip you and shape you and make you for that purpose. That's what sanctification is. It's the process of God shaping you for his purpose and for his glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I, yes, that is true. You see, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is no freedom. So if the Spirit of the Lord isn't with you, there is no freedom. But where he is, there is freedom. Verse 18, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. You see, when you come into a relationship with God, the veil has been removed from your eyes. You now see. See, the Spirit of God understands things that can't be understood without the Spirit. And with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed, that means sanctified, into the image of the ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God's Spirit transforms us. Now, here's the thing. Each one of us have a decision, and it's a daily decision. Will I feed the Holy Spirit that God has deposited in me, that dwells in me, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says lives in you? Or will I feed the flesh that still exists? You see, this is the interesting thing. When we come into relationship with God, God doesn't go, oh, you're no longer gonna sin. I'm gonna remove that from your life, and you're never gonna have any more trouble. You're never gonna be tempted. You're never gonna struggle. No, what God does is he implants his spirit in us and we still have our, what the Bible describes as our sin nature, our flesh. And so there's this war that wages in us, it's called spiritual warfare, that takes place in the life of every Christ follower. And we have to choose on a daily basis, will I feed the spirit of God that lives in me? And as I feed the spirit and I'm on the sanctification process, I'm not getting more of the Spirit. Don't, don't misinterpret. You're not going to get more of the Spirit. The Spirit fully and completely dwells in you if Christ's blood covers you. But what you do is you turn more of your life and trust over to the Spirit. And as you trust Him more, you are releasing power for Him to work in your life. For many of us today, we find ourselves where we're in control. Yes, the Spirit dwells, but we're feeding our flesh. We're doing things that or in opposition to the word of God, but yet we won't. We're not even thinking about what God would want us to do. We're just doing what we want to do. We're not in the word of God. And we wonder, why is the flesh dominating my life? Well, you have literally suppressed God's spirit that dwells in you and fed your, your sin nature that still exists. And one of those is going to rule. That's why when you describe the Christian life, all of us have ups and downs, right? The hills and the valleys. Well, all of us know that we have those spiritual valleys. And I'm not talking about when you go through hard time. I'm talking about when you've kind of rejected the things of God in your life. Where we're feeding the flesh and it is winning. 
doesn't mean that God's spirit has left you. No, Jesus said he will be with you forever. But it's that you have began to reject what God wants you to do and feed the flesh in your life. Thank you for coming out here, man. You got to give Charles a hand. So I hope that you have a, a better understanding of the Holy Spirit's role in your relationship with God. That he saves you, he dwells in you. That's the reason you can pray. That's the reason you have communion with God. That's the reason you have a relationship with God. So I wanna ask you again, is the Holy Spirit, Spirit present and real in your life? For many of us today, the thing that, that we need to do, the reason that God brought you here today is so that you could do what Peter said in the book of Acts. He said, repent and believe that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You've allowed other things to dominate your life and you've been feeding the flesh and it is winning. And you need to repent of those things and do whatever it takes to remove those things so that the Holy Spirit of God can truly rule and reign and, and lead your life. So we've talked about who is he. We've talked about what his role is. The third thing I want you to know, and this is where we get to the nuts and bolts, is what is his role in our daily lives? I'm gonna cover these really quick, okay? What is his role in our daily lives? The first thing I want you to know is the Holy Spirit comforts you. He comforts you. He's with you. He's, he's described in John 14 as the comforter. Check this out, 14, 26, it says, but the comforter, who is the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, whom, you, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus talking, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now he's talking to his disciples and saying, listen, I know I've taught you a lot of things, but don't worry, there's one who's gonna come, he's gonna comfort you, he's gonna be with you, and he's gonna remind you of all the things I've taught you. Not only does he just comfort you, he guides you. John 16, 13, it says this, it says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is really important because I talked about the word of God is the truth of God in week one. You see, the Bible is, is breathe, it's the breath of God, it's the spirit of God that spoke this word into existence. In the Old Testament, the spirit of God would come upon the people of God and it would be temporary because Christ had not yet come. But God would use those people to, to lead and to do what he wanted to do to carry forth his vision and mission. And it is through those people that God would pen the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, God would literally come and indwell people, just like he does in your life and my life, and he would inspire them, and they would write the very word of God. This is important. The way that you understand the word of God is by the Spirit of God living in you. The Spirit of God lives in us, and this is written by the Spirit of God. It says that about itself in Timothy. And it is through that that we understand the Word of God. Not only that, but he, he also helps us in our weakness. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Paul writes, and he says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. <laughs> there it is. For we do not know what to pray, for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. How awesome is that today? That's how much God loves you. Is even when you don't know what to pray because you're so distraught or you're just confused, God prays for you. The Holy Spirit knows you better than you know you. Verse 27, it says, And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You see, even when we're stupid, God's still in control because God dwells in us. And he even prays for things when we don't know what to pray. Even when we're headed down the wrong road, God hadn't let you go. He's still praying on your behalf. Maybe you hadn't talked to God in a long time. I want to remind you today, if you're in relationship and what I described by using Charles as an example, if you call on the name of Jesus, God's spirit is fully and completely alive in you. You don't need to do something to get more of the spirit. You simply need to repent of your sins so that you can turn control back over to the spirit that already lives in you. The fourth thing I want you to know is not only does it help in your weakness, he fights spiritual battle. In Ephesians chapter six, at the end of chapter six, it's known as the armor of God verses. And, and he says, Paul says, and pray in the spirit. You see, we pray in the spirit. We pray to God the Father, through Christ the Son, in the spirit. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. He helps us fight spiritual battle. Not only that, but number five, he helps you read and understand the Bible. I talked about this already, but I want to point it out again. 1 Corinthians 
uh, 2, 14, it says this, the person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God. This came from the spirit of God, but considers them foolish and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. Before I was a Christ follower and before God's spirit came and lived in me, the Bible could have just been another book of Shakespeare. That's why people who aren't born again will say, ah, oh, the Bible's just some old book. Well, because they can't see it. It's delivered by the Spirit, and the Scripture's clear without the Spirit. It's foolishness, but when the Spirit comes and lives in you, the Bible is described as active and alive, sharper than any double-edged sword. Not only that, but it helps us share about Jesus. It helps us share the gospel, number six. The Holy Spirit, in 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8, it says, For the Spirit of God uh, gave... Uh, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about the Lord. The testimony about the Lord is the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't live in fear. God's spirit is with you. You can't do it, but yes, guess what? You can because God lives in you. No human can do what only God can do, but God is with you. He dwells in you. Number seven, he also bears fruit in our lives. Galatians 5, 22 and 25, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all things that I don't have. But God gives them by the Holy Spirit. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, check this out, I just talked, have crucified the flesh. That means they deny the flesh with its passions and desires, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's the whole description I just gave you of feeding the flesh or feeding the Spirit. You gotta stay in step with the Spirit. Now I want you to imagine this is what God has done in each of our lives to who, who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is like a seed that God plants in your life. It's like a seed. And as you water what God has planted, as you feed the Spirit, fruit grows. But if you feed the flesh, weeds grow. If you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, it's because you're not feeding the Spirit of God that dwells in you. You gotta feed the Spirit of God with the things of God. That's why being part of the church community is important. That's why worship is important. That's why community and, and group life is important. It's not so you can check it off a box. It's so that you can feed the Spirit of God that dwells in you. Iron sharpening iron, doing life together. It bears fruit in our lives. The eighth thing it does and last is it dwells in us. I talked about this already, but I want to reiterate this one more time. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? I explain that as clear as I know how with Charles. Now he's writing in 1 Corinthians to a bunch of sex-crazed maniacs sleeping with their mother-in-law and all kinds of junk. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? So they're not like the spiritual elite, right? No, God's spirit dwelled in them because they had believed in Jesus Christ who is in you, whom you received from God. You are not your own. Don't keep feeding the flesh, church in Corinth. Don't keep feeding the flesh, Vaughn Forrest. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Man, what an amazing God that doesn't just save us, but he saves us, comes and lives in us, guides us, directs us, has a purpose for our lives. But it goes back to that question I started with, is the Holy Spirit present and real in your life? If you find yourself with just a garden full of weeds, then I'll just tell you what you, what you need to do is you need to just talk to God. You need to have a conversation with God and say, Lord, I confess that I have got caught up in a bunch of sideways junk. Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's just doing your own thing, which is sin. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, man, the Bible calls us to repent, to, to turn away from that and turn back to God so that we can experience refreshing from God. If that's where you are, I, I want to pray over you. Maybe you've been following God for a long time and you're just stuck in a rut. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Something like this, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, right now I come to you and I'm stuck. Lord, I, I have to confess 
I've been ignoring you. Lord, I've been caught up in stuff that has nothing to do with you. And Lord, today I confess that. And right now, Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me of that. I'm asking you to renew my heart. I'm asking you to refresh my soul. God, I know your spirit is in me. It transformed my life when I called on your name. And Lord, I'm asking for that renewal again. In Jesus' name.